And uh, we are glad to be here one more time. I'm really thankful for you all. Um, I amazing. I'm starting to get people telling me, you know, we're watching you on television, and your messages are full of substance. Crazy. And I said, well, thank God for that. Yes. And they were saying, you know, uh, we look at the other folks that are preaching about just the kind of standard stuff you hear today, but it's like you really have a mind to help people. And I said, well, yeah, uh, because you can't put a Band-Aid over a wound. Sometimes when you have a wound, you've got to go in there and clean out all that stuff that's left behind so you don't get an infection when that wound is closed. You've got to get it out. You've got to get knit back together right and get it sealed up real good. And that's how you really fix the wounds. So we have a lot of wounded people out here today. Uh, today, I got a little word from the Lord. It's out of the book of Genesis, the 19th chapter, the 17th, around the 17th. I'll be doing various, various verses. But uh, we're going to look at, I think, start reading from 19, um, uh, 12. Because really, uh, part of my subject has a little to do with this, but kind of going in a little more direction with it. But it does lay foundation for where I want to get to today. It says, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou any beside son-in-law and sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place? For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke unto his sons and laws, which married his daughter, and says, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons and law. When the morning arose, when the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, get thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, at least thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And it says in verse 16, while he lingered, while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hands of his two daughters. And the Lord be merciful in him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, look not behind thee, neither stay in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. If I skip down to verse 26, it says, But his wife looked back behind him, she became a pillar of salt. Now a lot of times, this scripture is used to, you know, talk about Lot's wife, how she is the one that looked behind and turned to a pillar of salt. But the reason I highlighted those other verses up, such as why he lingered and they had to take his hand to lead him out, was to show that it was a twofold problem. It wasn't just her, it was him as well. They had an attitude. And from this, my, my topic this morning, I just want to tell you, well, is don't be looking behind you. Don't be looking back. Uh, if you're going to serve God today, with the way this world is, you cannot be looking at this world for anything. You can't be looking at this world for leadership, and it's unfortunate. We have so many people in our churches that are looking to the political system for answers and for leadership. When that's not the case at all, when you see today leadership that many of our, our people in our churches are supporting, they are backing all kinds of lifestyles such as they have here in this Sodom and Gomorrah. I saw even where the leader of the city of Dayton has decided to join a boycott against North Carolina. Uh, we have these type of mindsets and leaderships springing up all across this country. Uh, you can't, we cannot as a church look to these people for leadership. We are, we're 
fussy, uh, many of us, about who we're going to vote for and all this. But when you look at what we're voting for, and this is how Lot was. Lot was attached to this place. We are, we're attached to the political system that we have no business being attached to. We, we are not of this world. We have a king, we have a leader, we have a God to look to for what's right and what's wrong. Um, this desire to be a part of the world has taken over the church. It's taken over the mindset of the leadership of the church uh, many places. And it's infested in our denominations and in our cultures so to the point now that we don't seem to be able to discern between what is right and what is wrong. Uh, sometimes when you get into worldly systems, if you're not willing to stand up and be criticized, if you're not willing to stand up and take the heat, you're going to have to capitulate and you're going to have to give in to those who are of Sodom and of our Gomorrah. And what happens is you end up looking like those people, even though you say that I'm not of them, I'm not with them, I'm against what they do, but yet you end up helping empower them into position to continue to do what they do. So when you look back into this world from which you were called out of, children, and you see the things that are going on, what you want to do is to make sure that you are truly not a part of it. Now, imagine if you ask a lot, a lot would have claimed that he had no attachment to this place. Yet he dwelt there, and to show how the Bible clearly shows that he was attached to the world. This is what's happening with the church. Many people in the church say, I'm not of the world. But they are more attached to the world because, and more attached than, than they realize. And the reason why they are attached is because the preaching today is not sound doctrine. The preaching that you hear today primarily is platitudes, it's a bunch of promises, of, it's grandeur, it's uh, we don't want to look at negativity, we don't want to face reality, or we don't want to say anything that's going to offend anybody. How can you live for God in today's world and not offend someone? Hmm. Amen. Your, your standard of living, your belief system should be such that it either attracts or repels. Mm -hmm. We have people today who believe that it's wrong for us to repel people. And they fail to realize it's not us that's doing the repelling, it's the Spirit of God that's in us. How can you serve God and be really truly like these people that we read about in the Bible? If you look at these men that are in the Scriptures, many of them, were they to live in today's world, someone would say, well, that was in a different time and a different era, and it doesn't apply, you can't say, you can't do, God's never changed. Peter, Paul, and the, many of the apostles that written, wrote the epistles were just as strong and hard as the Old Testament patriots were. Man, Ananias and Sapphira came and they lied to the apostles. And on the spot, he told, told them that their souls were going to be required and they were going to, they died on the spot. He condemned them to death on the spot. He didn't say, I'm going to bless you and heal you and God's going to forgive you for lying and the stuff that we would do today. <clears throat> People don't think in those terms because they think it's mean-spirited. They think that you're hateful to do something like that. If somebody came and they lied in the middle of the church and stood up and the pastor said, your life is required of you right now and they died. You'd have people condemning that pastor in the days. This is how messed up people are. And then they want to convince others that you have to accept this madness that they're telling people is right. 
And it's not. God doesn't like sin. He doesn't like sin around. He doesn't want sin in the church. He doesn't want sin in our life. He doesn't want sin anywhere or have any part to do with us. And so when you run into sin, you're supposed to do something. God did do something. He destroyed the place. Now, in the course of this, he had mercy on one saint and completely destroyed another one. Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt. Lot got forgiveness and got grace and mercy because the scripture said he lingered. God had commanded him to leave, to get out. Yet he lingered. And then he lingered so long that they had to <coughs> grab a hold of him. They had to physically take him out. He didn't leave on his own will. A lot of times you find that people are not leaving the world on their own will. Sometimes you have to forcefully do things. You have to, they may have punishments in place. You have to uh, sanction them. You have to rebuke them. You have to physically take them. You have to get them and get and ask them, shake them, what is wrong with you? You know better than this. Have to physically take action to get this man out of there. They kept having to tell him, quit looking back. Quit using the world's standards to make the decisions. Your decisions and your way as a child of God have nothing to do with what the world is doing. You cannot look at what they're doing, analyze how it's going to affect you, and put that into the equation to try to figure out how to live your life. Man, if you're going to live your life for God, you're going to have to live it brutally at times. You're going to have to live it honestly and truthfully. And sometimes people are not going to like that. Well, that's just too bad because you are not serving people. When you came over here, you don't have the obligation to the world anymore. You have no obligation to meet the world's standards. You have no obligation to be politically correct. You have no obligation to worry about their feelings. You only need to know what God says and to do what God told you to do. Quit looking back. Don't use these standards for your decision-making church. You, they have no place in your thought process because they are anti-God. When you look at Paul, even in the New Testament, when he was dealing with the Philippian church in the third chapter of Philippians, Paul talked about his worldly accomplishments and his accolades and how he had obtained education and how he had obtained righteousness and certification as a Jew by having met all the standards uh, of Judaism at the time uh, that he was from the main stock of Israel that he came from the tribe of Benjamin and that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews that is to say he was a man of pure bread and as he was a Pharisee concerning the law he studied the law, he knew the law he was a prosecutor under the law and he had zeal in it, he just didn't halfway go about his uh things that he did in the world, he did them with a zeal. Amen. He persecuted the church and he said, I was so zealous, I was blameless in my uh, law, in, in, in following the law. But he said, it got to the point where he understood now that those things that one time were a gain to him, those things that helped him advance in the world, that helped him to become a lead prosecutor, that helped him advance through the system were now at a loss to him because over in Christ he could not use those things because amen Christ was the one who gave him amen the life that he had Christ was the one who had called him and now Christ was the one who had set the terms of his salvation and so Paul said I have to look at these things that are in the world 
And these things that I see around me and that are here and they are now lost and lost to me. Man, he says, I suffer the loss of all things. And even though yet I have lost all this stuff, I realize they are but dumb. And that I may win Christ. We have people in the church today who have access to, and man, the highest positions in this country. They have had conversations, they have had dinners, they have been invited in, and those even some of those people have come into the churches. And today, unfortunately, when those people come into our churches, they don't get witness to what they have. What happens is now is the church members are more interested in taking a selfie with these individuals. Uh, they're interested in mugging with them and smiling with them as though having been with these people gives them some kind of special privilege or makes them some special person. Uh, they count, amen, the conversations and, amen, the access to these individuals and these, these spiritually wicked individuals in these high places as though they have uh, uh, it, it is a badge of honor for something they have done rather than taking the time to really sit down and talk to these people about where they're going with their souls. Uh, you see, that kind of boldness doesn't exist, but in a few places, that kind of mindset, amen, has escaped the church. And the reason why is because there are very few people today that have the mind of Jesus Christ. Uh, Man, they have the appearance of power. They have the look of someone who is saved, but there's no real power there. And man, it's just like if I come into your house and you've got a 120 inch TV there, and you're bragging about that TV and you show me how the wires are all hooked up, but what you don't tell me is you haven't had the cable bill paid and the cable's not turned on. So it looks like a greatest TV. I go tell my friends, oh, they got a huge screen TV. Did you watch anything on it? Well, uh, no, they didn't turn it on. It's not connected. The connection's been broken. <clears throat> this is the same thing today. Paul said, <clears throat> see, I had to find something in him. Amen. And what I found in him was I didn't have my own righteousness anymore. That what I had, what I bought, what I value, these things are not uh, presentable over here. Your, 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 your education is nice that you have a, a PhD. And it can be in th theology, and that's good. A doctor of divinity, that's wonderful. And man, if you're using that to impress people, you got your sheepskins on the wall. Those things, that's all fine. But you realize in Christ, those degrees don't mean anything. Paul had the religious degrees, and he said they were but dumb. Amen. Mm -hmm. So you think that you can sing, you sung in this church, you sung over there, you, we even see you on TV or every once in a while on the Word Network. And that's nice. Uh, uh, we, we see you friends with Bishop so-and-so, or you may be Bishop so-and-so. That's all fine and dandy in itself, but... Man, what do you really believe? What do you really stand for? Man, Paul talked about the most important thing for us as a church is to know Jesus Christ. Yep. Now, you got to know him. Now, how do you know him? You know, everybody says, oh, I know Jesus. Uh, 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 I saw Jesus in the 7-Eleven the other day, walking through the grocery store. You know, uh, I know Jesus. I know, oh, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus. I, my mom, grandma knew him, and my mama knew him, and I've been in, in the same son before you was ever born. Uh, well, the scripture says if you're going to know him, you will have to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, and you need to be made conformable unto his death. Now, to conform yourself to the death of Jesus Christ means that you're going to have to go through some things, and man, simply because of the gospel. Not because you didn't pay your car payment and they repoed your car. The devil didn't do that. You did that. Mm. Amen. You got kicked out of your house because you didn't make your house payments. Mm. No, the devil didn't take your house. You didn't pay your car payments. You didn't pay your house payments. Right. You see, you took your dp &L money and your gas and electric money and you went down and spent it on some clothes. That's what you did with your money. Mm. Amen. And you went out to eat. 
at some fancy restaurant to try to impress somebody and you blew the money that you did have and made it now you can't pay your bills. See? Right. See, this, this, that's not being made conformable. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, hey amen, looking at yourself honestly and understanding, are you still a part of the world? Do you still think like the world? I get heat all the time, get criticized because of my thinking. And the reason why is my thinking doesn't match up with the world's thinking. Mm -hmm. And all the time I'm told, Elder Essex, you don't vote. You, you know that's almost a sin not to vote. Because these people die for you to have a right to vote. Well, you're talking about worldly stuff. They die in the world. They die in their sin, in sins or whatever condition they were in. They die in the world. But who died for me to have the right? Amen. It's Jesus Christ. That's who matters. Amen. I'm voting for Jesus. Amen. I'm talking to somebody. I don't care who's in power that can deal with any situation. Amen. I've done pretty well in life following my, my Jesus. Amen. Amen. I've done pretty good. Amen. And I feel good about my soul in the process. Because I, if I need something, I can't go get on the phone and call my congressman. I can't get on the phone and call the president. Amen. There's only one person I can call. And that's Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the one who's going to answer my call at 3 o'clock in the morning. Amen. It's 3 o'clock in the morning and a crisis arise. As one politician said. Amen. And the phone rings. Who, who's going to be at the other end? I'll tell you who's going to be at the other end. You see, people's minds Amen. Have been, have been so manipulated that they put their trust in men rather than in God. They will say what they not, I trust in God. But with their actions, if you compare it to the scriptures, it don't match up. Amen. Now, this thing about depending on man, this is a horrible situation. Amen. I don't, for the sake of politics, uh, follow political thought because political thought for me belongs out there, not in here. I mean, it belongs out in the world, and that's where it is. The problems that we have in this world, it, it, it's not one or the other. The problem we have in the world is, is that there is no Christ. Man, there's no Jesus. Everybody wants to get rid of him. Everybody, we want him out of our schools. We want him out of our lives. We want him out of our government. We want him out of our business. And the people are going around even lying and saying that God said there was a separation between the church and the state, which is exactly the opposite because when you look in the Bible, the leaders of government, when they had a problem, came to the priest. For answers, to see what God says, what should we do in this battle? The priest is the one who they went to see. So, here we are. We wonder why our world is so messed up. We wonder why our homes are so messed up, why our children are so messed up. Because we have, amen, some of our homes, people who are going along with the world, who, who think that uh, they tell their children, uh, you need to have protected sex. No, you need to have no sex. Yes. Amen. That see, yes. well, they're gonna do it anyway. No. So I might as well give in. Oh, you might as well not either. Help us, Lord. Man, why wouldn't you stand and fight? Mm -hmm. Amen. If you give in on this, what else are you gonna give in on? Yes. See, it's a battle to be saved. If you want to serve God, yes. you gotta take a stand, and whether it's popular or not. Whether it's amen, in season or out, amen, you've got to stand on the word of God. God said no sex before marriage, then it's no sex before marriage. Amen. Man, you need to do a better job of explaining to your children, amen, the consequences and problems and taking them someplace and showing them these homeless kids and some of these people that suffered yes. because they had a man's sex when they wasn't married or they was young. Maybe that's what you need to show them. Or maybe sit down and teach these young men about what's going to happen to them financially if they have to take care of a baby and the struggle it is. And I like these little dogs that they get the kids and make them carry around and so they have to wrestle with them and see what it's really like. Get woken up 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then they'll understand Right. 
You just have to do a little better job. Spend some more time with them. Suffer with them. I know it gets on your nerves and it's hard and it's pressing, but you can't quit fighting. Yes. They're your children. What are they worth to you? What's their future worth to you? How much do you love them? Love sometimes is painful. Yes, it is. Love is not an easy road. This isn't an easy road. Right. Being made conformable. You're being made conformable. When you're making something to conform that don't want to conform, you're going to generate stress and you're going to cause heat. Help us. So when you're trying to make something conform that don't want to conform, when you start trying to bend steel and steel resists, you've got to put enough pressure on it. When you start bending, you start bending the clothes hanger, put your hand in the bin and see if it ain't some heat there. <clears throat> Matter of fact, if you really try to break it, it'll get so hot you can't even touch it. See, this is what conformable does. It, there's a resistance. That means, he says, it, it, here's the reason why. Why would I do all this? He tells you in the 11th verse of this third chapter of Philippians. He says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now this isn't a man who sounds overconfident about this obtaining resurrection from the dead. He says, if by any means. It means that there is a possibility that I might not make it. And when you start looking at life from that perspective and understanding why looking back is so dangerous, why all your attention has to be focused on where you're going, what you're trying to do, what's ahead of you, your goal in life is to obtain the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not guaranteed for folks walking around, oh, I know I'm going to do all this. And you ain't done nothing as near as much as Paul did. And he ain't walking around all overconfident. He said if. Right. Matter of fact, he tells you in verse 12, it's not as though I've already attained or either were already perfect. Now wait a minute, Paul. You mean the Apostle Paul saying that he's not already perfect? Mm -hmm. He hasn't already attained this resurrection? Listen, folks, you cannot be overconfident about this. And man, he says, but I follow after if that I may apprehend mm -hmm. that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ. Jesus. If, 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 if I may, if it's possible. Verse 13, he says, brother, here it is, brother, right here. I count not myself to have apprehended. You see, I don't already act like I've got there. I don't count myself already in the heaven. He said, the one thing I do, I do forget those things which are behind, and I reach forth unto those things which are before. And then he goes on, he says, I press for the mark yes. of the prize of the high calling yes. of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. this is what I've got to do. Okay, you cannot keep looking at the world. You can't, you got to get them out of your mind. you got to get them out of your vision. You cannot be influenced by peer pressure. You can't be influenced by what you see the world doing or the direction they're going or all these evil newscasters and media people who are pushing lifestyles and are pushing untruths that are uh, manifest. They don't want, amen, the word of God out there. These people whom we see on television, amen, are not promoting God. They are promoting lifestyles that are against the Bible. So we need to understand what we're saying. We can't allow them to pull us in and get us to take sides on these things that are ungodly unless we're going to side against it. We have to understand that they are agents for the devil. They are called according to his purposes for his ministry against the ministry of God. <coughs> Pressing for the mark of a high call. He says, let us therefore as we need to be perfect. Be thus minded. If you want to be perfect, he says, these things I just told you about, that's the kind of mind you need to have. Humility in your salvation. Not to the point of being a pushover, but humility and understanding that you ain't the same as you may think you are. 
Man, you ain't perfect as you might profess to be. Man, you need to have a mindset at all times that you got to press for this thing, that you got to examine yourself, that you got to look at yourself. Man, you got to look at what you say. Does what you say match the Bible? And today you find that many people out here who are preaching, who are teaching, who are claiming Jesus Christ are full of the world. They like the things the world likes. They watch the things the world watches. And man, they love cussing. They love sex. They love pornography. These are the kind of people, amen, and in secret, quietly, nobody knows or they think. Man, this is the mindset because this is what the devil has put in place. This is what today meant to what you see on TV. 40 years ago will not be allowed. You see commercials today with women, bras, men in underwear and stuff like this. This stuff wasn't even allowed on TV. And man, really this type of dress it should be for intimacy and privacy. The scripture talks about right. how you clothe yourself. You don't want your stuff hanging all out and and every, every which way you turn and, and all this stuff, not supposed to be like that. Man, this isn't of God, it's of the world. So the church is supposed to look different. The church is supposed to dress different. I've had people come into my office that I'm running to <coughs> instantly know that they are saved and begin to talk to them and they're surprised that I know. I can just tell mm -hmm. there's certain things that they don't do. There's certain things, ways they carry themselves. Man, you don't see saved folks with all this makeup all over them and everywhere. It's, it don't, it's just it's not of God. Uh, you don't see them with, amen, stuff hanging all out, short skirts all up to here and tops down in there and all this stuff with everything just, uh, you don't see it. Men dress a certain way. Can, you know, I, I, you don't see me with I, my shirt open and four buttons down and my chest hair hanging all out. No. I mean, you know, I button one at the most two. Uh, generally, I don't feel comfortable with one button. This is generally as far as I go. Uh, occasionally, I have one that might be short. I, I may open up a second, but for the most part, if my car, if 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 I got on a shirt, it's buttoned here because uh, there's a way that you have to carry yourself versus how the world looks. These things, people say, well, that's being judgmental. Well, in the Bible. Uh, if you understand that the righteous scarcely be saved, and the scripture says, Where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Yes, Lord, yes. It makes you think, Well, maybe I need to make my calling and election sure. Maybe I need to tighten up some things so that these, you know, there's no question, not for others, just for myself. Yes. Because what is it that I'm trying to show? What kind of attention am I trying to give? What am I trying to prove? What am I really trying to do? Because, truth be told, most of us, we have pride in something, in some area. Man, it's pride in our dress, pride in our where we live, pride in our righteousness, pride in ourselves, pride in our children, pride in our mates, Amen. pride in our homes, our cars, our money, pride in our looks. Pride, I got nice hair, I got the time I got to brush my hair, I know my hair, pride in my nails, my nails have to be perfect and all. You know, like some folks that want their skin, don't want no rush on, they got the lotion up all the time, and don't want to look ashy, uh, and they won't go outside with rollers in your hair. And man, there's something, and man, in all of us that we have pride in. Amen. So knowing that we are imperfect in our ways, it behooves us to try to work on perfecting ourselves. That's all of us. We're never assured. And you're never going to be perfected looking back. Because that means that you're comparing something back there to something up here where you're going. And he talked about running this race uh, we looked at earlier. If you're running a race and you keep looking back, chances are you're going to stumble. If you're running a race, you need to set your focus on what's ahead of you. And man, making every step sure, making sure you ain't about to step in a pothole. And man, if you're running a race 
And, I'm, and you're not on a paid track. See, this world race we're running is full of chuck holes and potholes and obstacles. Man, we need to be watching where we're headed. Amen. Have our focus on Christ. Making sure we're trying to get to heaven. Amen. Don't be looking back, saints, in your run. Don't be looking back at your life. Don't be comparing where you are to now and, and wondering, well, you know, I used to have this and I used to... No, 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 no. You got to remember when you was back there, you didn't have God. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you forget. They talk about the grass and not always not greener on the other side. Sometimes people be looking around and they think, oh, this is better. And then when they get over there, they find out it's actually worse. Sometimes in your life, you think that where you was at or what you had was better. You know, you, your husband might have left you, your wife might have left you, and, and now you all alone thinking, I wish they hadn't left and all this and that. They're gone. What are you wishing for? It's over. Forget about it. You ever be wishing, oh, I wish I had to stay, wish I had to, listen, that's dumb. If they left, let them go. All the thing you're going to do is make yourself miserable. Amen. If they divorce you, whatever situation, what happened, you, you know, you caught them or whatever, you had to divorce them, you did it, it's done. Leave that behind you. Why make yourself miserable? Why keep bringing up stuff to make you miserable? You're going forward, go forward. If you're going to go forward and you don't find a mate, you just don't have one. You got somebody to love you. His name is Jesus. Amen. And he can love you better than any person can ever love you. Mm -hmm. Amen. When you make up in your mind to adjust your mind to accept the situations that God has you in, then the problem will leave. Until you make up in your mind to accept that this is the will of Christ concerning you, this is his will for your individual situation. This is his, his will for your march forward. This is his will, not yours. Nevertheless, not my will, but that will be done. When you fix your mind, you'll fix the problem. <clears throat> my poor child, dead. I'll never get over it. Why? Why can't you get over it? You mean to tell me that the power of God is such that you can't get over it? A situation of, law, of a loss of a child, you don't know God. You don't know His power. Maybe you don't want to know His power. Let me tell you something. God can get you over any tragedy, any misery, anything bad that has happened to you in your life. Just because you haven't experienced it, it doesn't mean He can't. It means that, amen, you haven't yielded yourself. Yes. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Lost my mother. Mm. I'm never going to get over this. Well, you just said it. I'm telling you, that's your choice. Well, you just don't know. That's easy for you to say. No, I, I know what the Word of God says. I know what the power of God says. You mean to tell me that you believe in a God that doesn't have the power to heal you of a tragedy? Well, how can you expect Him to heal you of cancer? If the God you believe in can't get you over the loss of your mama, he'll never ever get you, amen, healed from cancer. Hmm. It's because you're not receptive to it. It's because you refuse. It's because you want to keep looking back. You have a desire for what you want. And your desire is stronger, amen, so strong that the word of God can't work in you. Did, did it tell you in the Bible Jesus had to leave Mary he couldn't work in because of unbelief? So he can't work in you because of unbelief. He can't heal you because of unbelief. When you believe in God, that son, that mother, I don't care if your child was shot down like a dog in the street. And there's been so many people who are going through this and experiencing this. But yet you see some people who are able to say, I just forgive them and move on. And others who, who are still just broke down and crying going through. What's the difference? What is the difference? The power of God is able to work in either case. So why is it that he's working in some people's tragedies and not in others? It has to do with faith. It has to do many times with preaching. What you have been taught. Mm -hmm. 
Have you been prepared for tragedy? Yeah. Have you have you gone through this? Your pastor, minister, or the minister you up are uh, up uh, under deal with realities of life, or do they feed you candy all the time? Help us, Lord. Yeah. Man, are you being fed solid food and meat to help you, or are you just getting a whole bunch of uh, junk food? Many times the problem is in the preaching. So I want to extend to those of you who are listening today and those of you who are here. Man, the idea of not looking back. I want you to think about things that you are dealing with. Personal issues in your life and things that are going on. And I want you to begin to look at yourself, not at the problem, and begin to ask yourself, am I the one blocking my recovery? Am I the one that's causing Amen. My misery and my suffering. Yes. And if you look honestly, you're going to find, yes, it is you. Yes. It's not God. Mm -hmm. Amen. You say, I don't know how to breathe. I tried. Well, that's the problem. You tried. Why don't you just surrender? Why don't you just give up? This when a lot of times when God works is when you quit trying. When you say, I give up, I, I surrender, Lord, you're going to have to do this. And you open up for him to come in to heal you. Lord, heal the hearts of those who are suffering today, those who are brokenhearted. We pray, Lord, through this message that somebody, Lord, today who needs healing will yes. be healed. Someone that needs help will be helped. Someone, Lord, who's been looking back into things of the past and, and, and having confusions and issues, God, be delivered from that today. God, through the power of this message, through faith, Yes. Lord, we ask you to touch somebody's life that's sitting out there. Somebody that's lonely. And the families have forgot about them. Mm -hmm. Man, they're left all alone. Somebody who's sick, who has, hasn't gotten the healing that they desire. Mm -hmm. The Lord, are going through. Lord, mentally, mostly physically, and spiritually. Yes. We ask in the name of Jesus that you bless and heal them today. Yes, in Lord. Jesus' name. Jesus. God bless you. We pray that this message will be a blessing to somebody. And it will help you. And at this time, we want to close out the service today, and we're going to extend the opportunity for prayer. Amen. 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 God bless you, saints, and thank you for your patience today. And then at this time, if you need prayer, we'll ask you to come quickly. If not, we're going.